Good morning, everyone. I think uh, I'm audible to every one of you. If uh, that not be a case, then just type in a chat box. My chat box is all open and uh, you can see my screen, I think so. So I've written certain rules for this uh, class. But I just read it out if in case you cannot uh, see the screen properly. So you need to sit in a quiet place with a high speed internet, particularly near to your server. Wherever your, wherever your Wi-Fi router is there, and then with a copy and a pen so that you can jot down important things. Don't worry about the recording of this uh, video. This is being recorded, and I will uh, send you the link of the Google Drive in which I will post the recorded video at the end of the session. So this class is going to be of one hour, and uh, mind you, this was supposed to be a tutorial topic. So I will be talking much more of a practical aspects of uh, the management according to advanced trauma life support. Uh, apart from that, the other requirements is to use headphones to avoid distractions so that you can listen to me very carefully. Uh, and then if possible, connect to zoom.app on the laptop. Uh, try to keep your microphone and the video mute so that I cannot hear you eating food or drinking milk or anything like that. And uh, ask by writing precise questions on the chat box. So uh, that is all. Well, I can uh, keep your microphone mute. Okay, so that's okay. So I think everybody is able to understand what I'm talking about. And anybody, if in case you think um, that I'm speaking very fast and uh, with that concept which I'm trying to share with you is difficult to understand, you can just um, um, uh, raise an alarm by putting things on the chat box. So I will keep on looking on the chat box simultaneously and I can respond to it immediately. Uh, apart from that, uh, I don't have any ass assignments as per, but then I will definitely be posting uh, a quiz on the uh, Viber as a poll, which we did uh, yesterday. And then I would like to take your feedback. So the topic, uh, as you are already being circulated, is about advanced trauma life support. <clears throat> uh, so I think most of you have already uh, listened to this topic earlier. And yesterday, we have a guinea pig team of 25 people where we did uh, circulate this particular class and um, the feedback was very helpful and I'm trying to improve upon the things which we were not able to do that yesterday. So <clears throat> uh, I'm just spending some more time on this uh, initial talk so that other people can join me. So now we have total of 87. People are still joining. Mm. Well, the to, in these classes, one should remember that you should come early. Otherwise, you will keep on uh, adding up later and uh, you will be missing the initial part. I'm just trying to arrange my screen so that uh, you all people can see what I'm writing and what people are joining in between. Okay, so if uh, the team is all set, there are almost 91 people at present. So we'll keep on adding people as they uh, appear on the screen. Uh, well, this topic is regarding initial assessment and management of a trauma patient. So as you have already listened to me, maybe earlier classes, the management of the patients, particularly in trauma, is far, far different from how we manage the patients in an outpatient department uh, scenario. Uh, in OPD, we are basically concerned with the most common diagnosis. Whatever the patient presents with the symptoms, we like to uh, make differentials according to the most common occurrences of the disease in that pattern. However, in the trauma, the most important thing is to diagnose things which is most fatal at the earliest so that patients should not die initially and also to maintain his physiology so that he can, should not develop any disabilities in future or may should not develop a secondary injuries, which I will be discussing. Uh, the other important thing in a traumatic situation management is that we should also try to 
uh, um, um, manage patients as soon as possible in a systematic manner so that we are not missing injuries. Now, most of the patients uh, may be talking as well as walking to the emergency, but then those patients who are unconscious may not be able to put forward their problems. So as a doctor, it's our responsibility to find out these problems at the earliest, try to avoid any missing injuries anytime in between so that we should not miss anything which can kill the patient a little later. <clears throat> so uh, the primary survey which we usually do in ATLS protocol is has to be repeated frequently to identify any deterioration in the patient status as well as to indicate the need of additional intervention. So henceforth, one must understand that in ATLS protocol as such, the diagnosis and the resuscitation, they go side by side. I will again request all the participants to mute their microphone that is possible from your end, or I will just try to do it from my end again. We'll open up all these microphones at the end of the class. If in case uh, somebody needs to ask me verbally also, that can be done. Okay, <clears throat> so let us begin with a case scenario. So this was a 48, 44 year old gentleman who was brought in the hospital in the emergency section as he crashed head on into a wall. Patient was found unresponsive at the scene and he arrives at the hospital via basic life support team, uh, which is usually not seen in Nepal scenario, but then you may be working somewhere else where, where the hospital pre-hospital team actually evacuates the patient and brings him to the hospital on a C collar in the place and is strapped to a backboard or a spinal board, as you say, and the technicians are assisting and ventilating with a bag and mask. Now, what should be the sequence of priorities in assessing this patient? So do you need to specifically see for, uh, for specific injuries at before the initial management of the patient? If it does, if this is not the case, then how should you proceed? This is a very, very important question because uh, whenever you see an unconscious patient brought it to the emergency, the most uh, common reflex which we all doctors um, face is to get a CT scan at the earliest because something must have gone wrong in his brain and that needs to be managed. But then in doing so, we may be missing the most important part and that is the initial resuscitation of the patients. So that has to be taken. And henceforth, what is the most ob important objectives of the ATLS protocol is that we have to have follow a correct sequence of priorities for assessment of multiply injured patients. We should apply the principles outlined in the second and the, and the primary and the secondary surveys. And then explain also, Okay, there are four more people who are coming up. Okay, so, uh, and also we have to explain how a patient's medical history and mechanism for injury can also contribute to the identification of the injuries and to also identify the pitfalls associated with the initial assessment and the management of an injured patient. And at the end of the resuscitation, we also have to identify those patients who needs to be transferred for definite management. <clears throat> So whenever we are uh, trying to manage any patients, uh, we have to uh, follow certain standard precautions, which, uh, which, which you can see on the screen here is that the healthcare workers, the doctors and the nurses who are attending to the patients are wearing a cap, a gown, gloves, mask, shoe cover, and a protective eyewear or face shield. This is absolutely important because we may get contaminated with the blood coming out of the patient's uh, body and as well as the secretion, so that can actually contaminate us. So we should be wearing all these precautionary measures. Now the most important thing which we also have to understand is how to remove the helmet. Well, in the Nepal, the most common uh, road traffic accidents which you will be uh, uh, managing uh, in the emergencies is patients who are driving a, a bike and then met with an accident, and they usually are wearing a helmet. Now, if I, removing a helmet is still a procedure which everybody has to take in a systematic manner. So as you see on the screen on their top left, the two people are required to remove this helmet. So one person would be stabilizing the neck and the other person by curling his fingers on the base of the helmet will try to remove it in a sequence. Now, as you can see the sequence here, the first of all, you will curl the finger on the side of the helmet and will pull the sides apart so that he can actually move the helmet above the ears. And then by rocking movement of the helmet, he will try to lift the helmet off the chin first and then off the occiput later. 
So that's how you have to remove it uh, one after the another in a sequential manner. Uh, at the same time, while you're rocking that with the helmet, one should be very much in the uh, should be taking care that uh, the head, the neck should not be moved. Hence, for this second person will be stabilizing the patient's neck. I can still listen to many people talking. If you cannot, if you're not able to mute your microphone, then you can just keep silent so that uh, other people won't listen to you. So initial assessment always starts with a primary survey and resuscitation should go simultaneously using a team approach. So not everybody should be doing the same thing. So as you can see, see here, there are four people around the patient. So one is ascultating the patient. The other one is looking at the, the long bones. The third one is looking at the chest and the respiratory pattern. And the fourth one who is sitting on the top of the head is trying to speak to the patient. So that's how everybody has his own job uh, earmarked. Now in this class, I will not be talking about this team approach because that is something which will follow later. I would like to talk about how the initial assessment and resuscitation go simultaneously by an individual doctor. So the concept of this initial assessment starts with preparation, which we've already talked about, followed by a primary survey and resuscitation adjuncts. Then we have to re-evaluate before we go on a detailed secondary survey again reevaluate and then we have to plan for a definitive care or transfer the patient to the other centers now <clears throat> this evaluation pattern or the primary survey follows the pattern of a trimodal pattern of death now you must be aware of this trimodal pattern of death which includes immediate death early death and late death so 50 percent of the mortalities which occurs after a trauma trauma uh, occurs in the as immediate death now this may be preventive but then uh, a doctor and a nurse would not be able to do anything about that because that has to be done either by the government, by making good roads, by putting up light, uh, traffic signals for the drivers who are driving the, the vehicle to keep their vehicle in a proper shape, to drive in a, in a controllable speed, as well as not to be drunk while driving. So these all are preventive measures, but then this can nothing can, can be done uh, from, the, from the medical perspective. However, early death and late death, which comprises around 30 to 20 percent patients, that are completely preventable. And henceforth, if we can actually target for care on the early deaths as well as late death, the patients can have a good survival as well as good life. Now, the concept of golden hour says that any patient, if in case of sustained trauma, should be managed within the first hour of the trauma, which is very hard to achieve because in conditions of Nepal where the patients are not wheeled into the uh, to the trauma center immediately. These patients won't land up in the emergency within one hour. So in such cases, what we have to use one hour is the first hour, the golden hour is the first hour when the patient comes to the hospital. So without wasting any further movement, we should be embarking on the patient's treatment plan immediately. Now, <clears throat> there's a quick way to assess a patient in 10 seconds. Ask the patient says on her name and ask the patient what has happened. So you may have seen uh, some doctors going to the emergency and the moment the patient is wheeled in, uh, greet, after greeting the patient, immediately ask us on her name and then asking what has happened, how the trauma occurred. So if the patient can tell his or her name, definitely the patient is going to be um, conscious as well as uh, he's able to understand things. And uh, if the patient can tell you what has happened, this means the patient's memory has been intact. So an appropriate response actually confirms that the patient has had a, a patent airway. There was a sufficient air reserve so that patient can speak out. There was a sufficient perfusion as well as clear sensorium. Now, hypoxia and hypertension are the major killers. Uh, the problem of hypoxia and hypertension is that this is a chart which is, is giving us an idea about the odds ratio or the possibility of death because of occurrence of hypertension and hypoxia as compared to those people who do not have hypoxia and hypertension. So if you can see hypertension kills four times more, hypoxia kills six times more, but if the patient has both hypoxia and hypertension, the chances of mortality is 13 times more. And that has to be, that has to be always be in your mind. So whenever you uh, see a patient, of trauma in emergency, try to avoid hypoxia and hypotension as much as possible and try to con recover these patients of these conditions as early as possible. 
Okay, so the hypoxia and hypertension, besides actually killing the patients, can also cause secondary brain injury. Now, you must be aware of this fact called primary brain injury. The classes have all been taken. So this is because of the direct impact with the trauma, just leading from uh, skull lacerations, fractures, contusions, cerebral lacerations, intracranial hemorrhage, or diffuse agent injuries. But as the time passes by and these conditions are not taken care of immediately, then secondary brain injury sets in, which are primarily due to increased intracranial pressure because of the bleeding or the edema of the brain. Hypoxia and hypertension. Look here, it's again here. So hypoxia and hypertension can again cause secondary brain injury as well as electrolyte imbalances and other free oxygen vehicles. So henceforth, we have to be taking care of these conditions. So primary survey always includes A, B, C, D, E. You, should, you have already uh, uh, listened about that multiple times. So A means airway, con get control with C is fine protection. B is breathing and ventilation. C circulation with hemorrhage control. D is neurological disability. So this is an assessment of neurological disability to find out that the patient may have some neurological problem. And then expose the patient under, uh, under a control environment so that you can actually see for other injuries as well as evaluate the patient and screen the patient for, a, for his pony practice. Now, Primary survey, the priorities are same for all the patients, either be a pregnant patient or be an elderly patient. The priorities are always same. So henceforth, you should always look at the patients using A, B, C, D, E protocol. You're not going to skip any one of these and you're not going to, to go forward until unless the, for the initial components are well resuscitated. If the patient deteriorates, you should again come back to A. So if in case you are looking for the circulatory problems and then you find that the patient is, have, is gasping for breath, his saturation falling, then you should again come back to A rather than continuing to D and E and then going for secondary survey. <clears throat> but there are certain special populations uh, where you should be uh, cognizant of the fact that the vital parameters may be different, like in elderly or infants and children, pregnant women, obese and athletes. So say for example, in athletes, uh, the usual basal heart rate is on a lower side. In elderly patients, they may be taking beta blockers. So that may actually hide the response to a, uh, a, a developing hypovolemic or a hemorrhagic shock. So you should be cognizant of the fact that these particular population or the medications these patients are taking may create some amount of uh, changes in vital parameters. Henceforth, the vital parameters which we consider for a normal, healthy adult male may not be equal to other people. Similarly, in pregnant women, we have to keep try to keep the patient in a uh, left lateral position so, so that her intra IVC is not compressed by the fetus. Uh, but then this should be done only in conscious patients who are not complaining of spinal injuries and they are not having a backache or any neurological weakness. So in those scenarios, we can even ask the patients to lie down on a left lateral position. So these are certain little bit of changes, but however, most of the things remain the same. Now coming to the A, that is the airway. In this case, we should always try to look for or rather see for occult airway injuries. Occult means hidden, which is not seen from above. So maybe a patient may have a maxillary fracture, patients may not be able to open his mouth. So in that cases, we have to be having a little bit of um, um, a, a thinking of, an, of a detective so as to not miss these particular problems. Now there are signs and symptoms of airway compromise, uh, which may be because in, pre in presence of a change in voice or a sore throat, noisy breathing, listening and hesitation. So an agitated patient should be considered to have an airway compromise until unless proven otherwise. You should not give um, sedative immediately to these patients just because they are agitated. And try to first rule out that the patients may not have any airway compromise. Similarly, you have to check for tachypnea, abnormal breathing pattern, and then late oxygen saturation in terms of saturation uh, which is measured in pulse oximeter this is a late sign so these this actually means that somehow the patient has suffered hypoxia for a very long time and now it is being evident on a pulse oximeter so try not to see this thing in a late phase try to pick up these features as early as possible then uh, when to intervene well if the patient has an impending airway compromise like a laryngeal edema, if the patient is having difficulty in breathing, by use, by, which can be evaluated by signs of use of secondary respiratory muscles. 
and then the patient is unable to protect his airway. Say, for example, the patient's ZCS is less than nine, eight or below. In that cases, that the protective reflex is gone, and it's for these patients who require an intervention to maintain a patent airway. Now, how do you maintain a patent airway? Well, this can easily be done by, first of all, cleaning any of the objects which may be in the mouth. Remember, not to put your finger in a patient who's unconscious. He may actually bite your finger. So an unconscious patient never, never put a finger. Ask the patient to cuff anything out which is there in his mouth. If the patient is putting a denture, ask the patient to remove the denture by himself or herself. But try not to put your finger inside the mouth at any given time. The person may chew your finger off. Uh, in that scenario, you can actually put an airway. So an airway are of multiple uh, types. It can be a nasopharyngeal airway or an oral pharyngeal airway. So these things can be done. And if the patient has a problem ventilation, you can do a bag and masking ventilation. If in case bag and mask is not good, then you can even intubate the patient. But before you intubate the patient, always try bag and masking. Now, while doing a bag and masking, always, always, always have two people in hand. One person should be giving an uh, inline immobilization of the neck so that you are not allowed to move the patient's neck. So cervical control has to be maintained. Now, the reason why we are putting up so much stress on cervical control or cervical embolization in the airway management is, is the change or the difference in prognosis of an incomplete spinal injury and a complete spinal injury. Now, complete spinal injury, hardly 10% patients will ever be able to move their limb, but they will never be able to walk back to their normal life. However, if the patient is having an incomplete spinal injury, 90% of the patient will be walking back to their life. So such is the difference in prognostic outcome of an incomplete as compared to a complete spinal injury. And henceforth, all the focus while trying to manage the patient's life should also not to allow the patients to go into a complete spinal injury. So henceforth, we have to keep the patient's neck immobilized during all these times. Now, the second one is breathing and ventilation, which you can actually be, uh, be looking at by the patient's respiratory rate, uh, difficulty in breathing or use of uh, uh, secondary muscles. Then you can auscultate the chest for air entry, and then you can see for the oxygen saturation. Uh, tympanicity or percussion is a very, very good test, which you also always use to find out whether the patient may have developed hemothorax or a pneumothorax. If a suspicion is there, Try to put in a tube immediately. Now, diagnosis of a tension pneumothorax or a tension hemothorax is never radiological. Tension means patients can die anytime. So this is a purely a clinical um, um, diagnosis. And if in case you have that, you can do, do with a needle thoracostomy and then you can go ahead. So we can talk about this procedure later. <clears throat> then uh, um, we have already talked about that. Okay, in the circulation part, basically in circulation part, we are much more uh, involved in finding out the, the site of the bleeding so that we can stop the bleeding at the earliest. And at the same time, we also have to maintain the good organ perfusion. Now, organ perfusion assessment can be done by looking at the status of the end organs. So one of the most important end organ is the brain. So if the patient has shock, patient will definitely not have a good sensorium. Either he will be agitated or he will be start, starting to go into uh, drowsiness. So that can may give us an idea that patient may have a decrease in the perfusion of the brain. Then the skin color, that is a cold, clammy extremities, which we usually keep talking about. So pulse will be tacky as well as the patient's uh, pulse volume will be very, very feeble. So in this scenarios, we can have an idea that the patient may have a decreased organ perfusion. Uh, which would demand to be uh, resuscitated with IV fluids as soon as possible. So that's why you must have heard about putting two white bowl cannulas as soon as possible rather than going for a central venous line. And then if the patient is bleeding from anywhere outside, try to tamponade the bleeding by putting a pressure or by applying a sutures. <clears throat> okay. And then, uh, so we have to reassess the patient whether these measures have been good or not. So this pitfalls I've already talked about in my initial slide, elderly, children, and therese in medication. Uh, well, children can have tachycardia in most of their responses. Uh, but remember, if they start developing bradycardia, then that's not a good sign because the heart can actually pump blood 
in uh, in an extreme situation at a faster rate only to a limit after which it starts failing however in athletes they have a large reserve so that's why they can present with bradycardia in the initial phase but as soon as uh, the the body requirements increases they can go on a very high tachycardic phase elderly however do not have too much of reserve and hence for they may have a high risk of going into cardiac ischemia if in case they are hyper if the tachycardia is allowed to go on unimpeded well in disability section we try to look at the patient's uh, gcs as well as the pupillary response and the power of all four limbs now glasgow coma scale is something which everybody of us should know without any uh, confusion so in this case uh, what we are looking at is the eye response best verbal response best motor response giving a total score of 15 so an eye score is very easy to understand the patient opens his eyes spontaneously it's a given a score of 4 if the patient can is open his eyes to speech and it is 3 if in case it does not open his eyes at all it is 1 if in case it opens by uh, his eyes by on pain that it's 2 verbal it's very again very easy you start from the lower score that is the one if the patient does not speak then it is not neither speaks neither produces any sound that is one however the patient just just produces some sound maybe a yeah uh, so that is the sound which is not a comprehensible word it is two however the patient produces some words not sentences some words but then these are inappropriate words So, for example, you may be asking his name, and he's saying "Aya, Dukhyo, Marioni." So, in those scenarios, you just give them a score of three. Confused means patient will be talking in sentences, but then the responses are not appropriate. So, you may be asking his name, and he's talking from which place is coming about. So, that can be a, um, a response which is confused. So, that is four. If the patient is completely oriented to time, place, and person, then give you a score of five. Uh, now, coming to the motor responses. now there were very too much confusion yesterday on the motor responses i like to clarify it again here so no response is one so there is no zero in the gcs so no response is one if the patient produces an extensor response that is two if the patient produces a flexor response that is three now this extensor and flexor responses are basically generated from mid brain and below that is to say that in both the responses there would be a tonic leg response to pain so that means the patient will stretch his lower legs whenever you give a pain however the difference in the in two and three responses is in the upper limb so if the patient's extend his elbow do an internal rota uh, internal rotation of the shoulder and is an adducted position that is an abnormal extension however the patient flexes his elbow does a uh, external rotation of the shoulder then that's an abnormal flexion response so in do both 2 and 3 the patient will be able uh, to do these responses but in the presence of tonic stretch responses of the legs however in uh, patients who is having an m5 responses patient will be able to localize the pain now pain in this scenario should be given in in a cranial nerve distributed area it should not be given in a spinal distributed areas because in these cases if in cases uh, you are giving a pain over say for example over sternum it's an spinal distributed area so patient will generate an a reflex so you will be confused because of the spinal reflex patient may develop a flexor response so that may be a confusing element so try to give pain over the cranial nerve distributed area say for example over the face that is in the supraorbital margin or uh, supraorbital uh, groove or over the uh, tragus so if the patient can localize the pain and try to show off the pain stimuli that is the pain score is 5 however the patient raises his arm but then is not able to pull his arm above the shoulder or to localize the pain then he gets a score of 4 and 6 is the patient can obey the command as such now sometime problem may arise if the patient is having a periorbital ecchymosis the patient may not be able to open his eyes so in this scenario the eye score cannot be graded and then you just give him a a suffix of c so the response should be written as ec rather than e1 or anything else however that is for both the eyes if the patient can open one of his eyes then his response should be accordingly rather than writing an ec in that case similarly the patient is intubated you cannot measure the patient's verbal response so in this case you have to give a suffix of t 
So rather than saying B1, you say VT. So this will tell us that in this case, the verbal responses cannot be graded again. Now in motor responses, this is not an evaluation of patient's power. This is just to see at what level of the cortical uh, functioning the patient is working. So say for example, patient is paraplegic or a quadriplegic, he is not able to move his legs and um, uh, hands, but definitely his facial muscles will be present. So you can ask the patients to close his eyes, to stick his tongue out, uh, to puff his mouth. If in case he can do that, this means that the patient is M6. However, the patient just grimaces or makes faces on pain, but do not follow your command, then patient's best response may be M5. You cannot see four, three, or two in these patients, but then definitely you can grade the patients as either M6 or M5, or patient being quadriplegic cannot be seen. So depending upon the GCS, the severe, uh, severity of the traumatic brain injuries can also be graded. So that has, has been taken in other classes. Now, uh, uh, similarly, uh, you actually see for the pupillary responses. So in pupillary responses, you see for two responses, basically. The one is the pupillary size, and the second one is the pupillary reflex. And that has to be seen in both the eyes. And beside this, you look for the motor power of the limbs. So all four limbs has to be measured, uh, motor power has to be seen. Uh, and this has to be graded according to the Medical Research Council or the MRC grading from zero to five. <clears throat> Now, once this is done and the patient is stabilized throughout this period, then only you go for the E component. That is, you expose the patients by undressing the patient. While undressing the patients, try to prevent hypothermia. And why we are undressing the patient is to see any injuries which may be hidden underneath the cloth. Now, as you can see in the figure, the patient is lying down straight. Now, what you can see in this scenario is only the front of the patient. Well, the injuries may be there in the back, maybe there in the rectum. So you have to pick, uh, log roll the patient to the other side so as to see the patient's back again. <clears throat> uh, I see my time is only three minutes, 33 seconds are remaining. So if in case this particular presentation breaks down because of loss of time, we may again reconnect and I will give you another opportunity to connect me further. So the recitation has to be simultaneously. So we have already talked about these issues. So I'm not skipping this slide. There are, there are various adjunct we can use for primary survey. So two of the adjuncts are of absolute importance. One is pulse oximeter and other one is a BP cuff, which has to be there at all the times to measure, to manage a patient's of trauma. However, you can put a patient on ECG as soon as possible, which is available in KMC emergency. So at Picat, you can actually have an idea about the patient's vitals every second. Uh, similarly, tubes should be placed in the patients to monitor the patient's urine output. So urinary catheter has to be placed. Gastric decompensation should be done by putting a, a gastric catheter. The patient is unconscious. Uh, so uh, pulse oximeter as well as ETCOT monitors in certain cases can be done. And ABG can be drawn to find out whether the patient is having any sort of acidosis or a patient may be retaining carbon dioxide. So these are the things which we can evaluate using an ABG. Now, two x-rays, which are a must in all the patients of trauma, particularly in those patients who have sustained either a high velocity injury or falling from a height. One is a chest x-ray, the other one is a pelvic x-ray. Now, in the chest x-ray, what we are much more uh, uh, concerned about is the presence of a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. So that can be found out in the pelvic x-ray. The pelvic uh, fracture can be there. So you have to be say, looking at it. Now, looking uh, just a small... A reminder for pelvic fracture. So clinically, we try to look at the pelvic fracture by a pelvic compression or a distraction test. So if anybody in the team finds a pelvic compression or distraction test positive, you are not allowed to repeat the test again. Once positive, it's positive. You have to tag the patient as positive and then you make it certain for all the members that they are not uh, repeating the test again, otherwise the patient will bleed to death internally. Uh, then there are other diagnostic tools like FAST and DPA or diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Now di diagnostic peritoneal lavage is losing its importance these days because ultrasound has become a major modality. So this is a slide from ultrasound trauma life support uh, system where both the diagnosis and the recitation can be done using an ultrasound. So in this, again, we follow the same protocol as A, B, C, D, E, and we do an ultrasound of both the lungs and the abdomen as well as the pelvis. 
so as to have an idea of the different components. Then uh, we have to consider early transfer if in case uh, we have already received the patient, but then the, the most important thing is uh, we should not delay the transfer for diagnostic tests for secondary injuries, not for the primary ones. So the patient has been resuscitated should be a transfer as soon as possible for the definitive care. Now secondary survey. So secondary survey is a complete history and physical examination. And this should be done only after the primary survey is completed. ABCDs are all reassessed again and the vital functionings have returned to normal. If these three criteria are not met, you should not go for a secondary survey anytime. You should go back, see the patient again, and the secondary survey. So now the secondary survey, as we have already said, uh, it has to be done only after the primary survey is completed. A, B, C, D, E's are assessed, reassessed twice at least, and then the vital functions are returning back to normal. So in those scenarios only, we have to go ahead with the uh, secondary survey. Now, secondary survey is, is just not physical examination. It also is about history. So we have to take proper history of the patient. We have to do a head-to-toe -to -toe physical examination. A complete neurological examination is mandatory in this phase. And then if in case the patient requires, we have to undertake a special diagnostic test like a CT scan. And at the end of the secondary survey, before you send the patient for a definitive treatment, Again, you have to reevaluate the patients because anytime the patient has deteriorated, we have to come back to our initials A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so in the history section, what we have to take history is according to an acronym known as AMPLE. So A stands for allergy, M stands for medications, P is for past history or pregnancy, L is for the last meal taken. This is very, very important. The patient is supposed to be intubated or the patient is having is to identify whether the patient has a risk of aspiration or not. And if the patient can tell the history about the events which has occurred uh, surrounding the accident or the trauma, the environment in which the patient was found and what was the mechanism of injury that has to be ascertained. Now, allergies is not only for the food, but also for the medications. And hence, food that has to be taken. Medications particularly like the patient is a diabetic and he or she is on oral hypoglycemic agents because the effect of this overchase is far longer. And in the patients who have sustained a trauma, we like to patient, keep the patients on nil or oral. So henceforth, these patients on fasting can develop hypoglycemia. So that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, similarly, past illnesses has to be again, again implored upon. Patient may have a CKD or a chronic renal failure. And if you're giving analgesics, particularly non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NACIDs, patient can end up having a severe renal damage. So that has to be considered. Similarly, patient's pregnancy history or the last menstrual history has to be taken. Um, as you all are aware, patients who has pregnancy of less than eight weeks have a very, very high risk of getting a radiation exposure or a problem to the fetus because of the medication. So that has also been taken so far. So <clears throat> beside the historical things, we have to identify the mechanism of injury. Say, for example, a patient who has sustained a burn injury in a flame can also have an inhalational injury because of the heat as such. So patient can have a ventilatory problem. So in that scenario, the mechanism of injury is important. Similarly, patient who had sustained a high speed trauma uh, can have uh, again to be looked for different other injuries which can be missed when we are trying to manage the patient in initial phase. So in secondary survey for examination, we have to start from the head. So an external examination is a must where we have to see for the skinny scalp bone. Now because of the hairs, most of the scalp laceration may remain hidden. So that's why with a gloved hand, we should palpate the scalp and see for any defect in the scalp or any blood staining over your gloves. Uh, mind you, you should never comment on a fracture of a, scalp, of a skull while palpating the patient's scalp. Why? Because galea aponeuritica, being thick, can appear on underneath a gloved hand as a fracture when the patient may not have one. And so you should not comment on a skull fracture just by palpating the patient's scalp wound. Then a comprehensive eye and ear examination. So in ear, we are trying to look for uh, say for bleeding or for CSF otoria, or for that matter, any difficulty in hearing of the patient after the trauma. In the eye examination, it is just not only for the visual equity, but also for the eye movements. 
So that has to be seen because patient may have, have uh, or, uh, orbital fracture of the either the wall or the roof or the floor. And because of this, there may be an entrapment syndrome. So that is an emergency again. Otherwise, the patient functional status, particularly of his vision, may be hampered. Now, the problem in these scenarios may be of unconscious patients or a periorbital edema where you can use ultrasound to look for these uh, orbital socket injuries and uh, eye in orbital injuries. And then patient may have an occluded auditory canal because of some uh, dirt inside the ear or some foreign body. So that has to be examined by a proper tool. Then maxillofacial injuries can occur. So that has to be evaluated by presence of brony crepitus or deformity over the maxilla or the patient's inability to close his mouth completely. So that has to be seen. If in case you suspect a patient to have an anterior skull base fracture, do not put an NG tube or a nasogastric tube because that may actually increase the, the trauma and can cause more further bleeding. Okay, <clears throat> beside this for the secondary survey of the neck, we have to check for the soft tissues over the neck. So the patient may have sustained a blunt or a penetrating trauma. Patient may have an airway obstruction or hoarseness. Well, this is maybe picked up initially. So if in case these are the symptoms, you should leave the secondary survey there and go back to the ABCD component of the primary survey. And then you have to look, look for any presence of crepitus or hematoma. The patient is having strider or bruy or difficulty in talking. So that has to be taken as a neck or a soft tissue injuries. In the secondary survey for the chest, you should start with inspection first, look for any abnormal in drawing of the intercostal spaces, which may tell you about paradoxical breathing or the patient is having a different use of uh, secondary muscles of respiration, palpate for any trauma, particularly the chest compression or chest uh, compression test should be done. Percuss the chest to look for any uh, hyper uh, um, resonance or uh, dullness over the chest wall. And then you have to auscultate for the bilateral air entry. If you have suspicion of attention hemothorax or pneumothorax, which may not be there in the primary survey, if the patient is developing in the secondary survey, again, go back to the ABCDE rather than continuing further with the secondary survey. And then x-rays are must, so you have to do an x-ray in these cases. In the abdomen, again, you have to follow the protocol of inspection first, look for the position of the umbilicus, whether the abdomen is moving or not with each aspiration, and then you have to palpate for any abdomen uh, pain. Well, hyaluvascus injury, if in case it has occurred, do not appear with peritonitis immediately after the trauma. Henceforth, signs of peritonitis may not be seen in patients with uh, trauma immediately. So they have to understand that. <laughs> Similarly, the patient is having a retroperitoneal injuries. Say, for example, a kidney injury or a splenic trauma, then again, uh, abdominal examination may not be that much helpful. So in that kind of scenario, you have to use special studies like an ultrasound, which we have discussed. Uh, then you have to do a perineal examination. So you have to do look for the perineal skin for any contusions or hematoma, for any lacerations, and then in the presence of urethral blood. So if the patient is having a blood in the uh, meatus, then always think of a urethral trauma. So patient may have urethral injury. Similarly, you have to do a, a digital rectal examination, not only to look for sphincter tone uh, or, or the bleeding inside the rectum, but also to look for a high riding prostrat, which can tell you that the patient is having a urethral trauma. And then in females, always, always examine the vagina. Patient may be bleeding or maybe having menstruation for that period. And then the any laceration should be documented. Uh, because of the proximity of the vagina to the urethra, these patients may have sustained urethral injury, so should be thought for that reasons. And the pelvis, uh, well, uh, I have shown you an X-ray here, but then it's much more for clinical. So you have to do a, a pelvic compression or, de or a distraction test. As I told you earlier, if found positive, you should not repeat it. Do not allow others to repeat it. Immediately apply a pelvic binder and ask for a consult. And then uh, clinically, you, it is just not the pain on palpation, but also on uh, equal length of the legs uh, can be suggestive of a so pelvic fracture. And then you need an x-ray to rule it out. Uh, then in the secondary survey for extremities, look for any contusion or deformity, pain or perfusion problem, and then peripheral vessels have to be checked. 
So there are two things which we are of concern to us in peripheral fractures or the long bone fractures. One is the neurovascular deficits. So you have to check for the capillary filling of the uh, distal part as well as the pulses. And then also check for the uh, neural status. So in terms of power or, or sensation in that particular part. And the second thing which we are worried about is the compartment syndrome. So patient may have developed a compartment syndrome. So that can be uh, uh, thought of by having a swelling, which is very, very hard. And then your patient will complaining of pain on squeezing that compartment. And uh, along with it, the patient will have distal neural or vascular uh, deficits. So patient starts having um, a decrease in the, in the capillary filling time in that particular part or the decrease in the pulsation. So that will give you an idea that the patient has developing a compartment syndrome, which needs to be decompressed at the earliest. Now in the brain evaluation, so that is basically the neurological evaluation. So in the first part, that is the primary survey, we were only doing three things. We were looking for GCS, pupil, and the motor power. But when we are doing for secondary survey, that, that entails a complete survey. So you have to not only look for these things, but also have to look for sensory examination, looking for reflexes, and <coughs> pulpit the, <coughs> sorry, pulpit the whole spine. <clears throat> Sorry. Palpate the whole spine from the back of the neck until the uh, coccyx so as to see for any tenderness or any uh, deficits um, in, as we are palpating it or any abnormal mobility. Uh, so this has to be done when the patient is log rolled to one side and then you have to do a parietal examination if not done in the abdominal examination to look for any completeness of the spinal injury if the patient has developed. So this is a, a way how you do a, a log roll positioning of the patient. So you can see the patient is lying on a, a spine board. A person over the head end of the patient is holding the neck in an inline immobilization way. The other two people are holding the torso and the legs. And then the fourth person is actually doing the evaluation from head to bottom and is also look for his correct examination. So this is how you do a log roll technique of evaluating the back of the spine. Now log roll technique should not be done often. So once you are doing it for the spine evaluation, you should also look for the back, for the chest, as well as the back of the abdomen. So you can have to look for the renal angle tenderness. You have to auscultate the patient chest from the back. So try to use the maximum amount of, try to get maximum amount of information from the patient examination while the patient has been log rolled to one side. <clears throat> now, uh, apart from that, there are certain special diagnostic tests like a CT scan, so that has to be done. However, if the patient is deteriorating, do not shift the patient until unless the patient is properly resuscitated. A doctor should always be accompanying the patient for these tests particularly those patients who are at a risk of deteriorating during transfer and, uh, and those patients who are not able to speak their problem. So these patients are at your disposal. So you should not be transferring a patient unsupervised in those cases where the patient is not able to talk his or her problem. Uh, then are the occurrences of missed injuries. So since we have too much focus regarding management of fatal injuries in patients of trauma, the chances of missed injuries is far, far commoner. So this can be decreased by looking by having a high index of suspicion according to the mechanism of injury. Say, for example, a patient sustained injury as he falls from height. What are the injuries would suspect? Either he had sustained injuries over the leg, over the thighs, over the pelvis, or the spine, as he's landing from a height on the ground. So these things has to be looked for, particularly before you clear the patients of not having any injuries. And then frequent evaluation and monitoring is must because these patients may develop certain uh, problems in, uh, in the later evaluation period. Now, pain management is very important because this may cause patients to be anxious. So you have to give an intravenous analgesics. So in these scenarios, the most uh, often uh, used analgesic is, uh, is a paracetamol injection. You can even use NACIDs, but then try to avoid NACIDs if in case the patient is having any element of crush injuries, has a past history of kidney problem, or the patient is having a high dose of antibiotics for some other reason, which can be nephrotoxic, or in the patients who is having a shock where the renal perfusion may be hampered. So these are the scenarios where the NSIDs has to be avoided. 
So before you do not have a proper idea or a complete idea of his renal status, try to avoid any CIDs to the maximum. You can just do away with the intra uh, uh, venous paracetamol for the first few hours. And then the careful monitoring is initial, as I've already told you. Uh, <clears throat> transfer is done to the, for the patients who requires a high level of care. Uh, this has to be done in those cases where the patients are having multi-system or complex injuries or the patient with comorbidities or age extreme. So these are those in those places where your institution may not have adequate capabilities to manage uh, these types of advanced uh, problems. So in these scenarios, if your local center is not able to tackle these types of patients, you should always plan to transfer the patients to a definitive care. So when should the transfer be taking place? After you have taken care of A, B, C, D, E's properly, and then you have done a secondary survey. So it all depends upon the facility of the local place or the first place of management of the patient. If in case that's not available, you should always try to shift the patient either to a trauma center or specialty facility. Say for example, in case of Kathmandu Medical College, if the patient is having a pericardial tamponade, <clears throat> pericardial tamponade, you just do a pericardiocentosis in the initial phase and try to shift the patient to a specialty center like Gangalal or uh, Manmohan Karik Center so that the patient can undergo a need for the treatment for, from the car CTVS point of view. Now back to the same case which we have started in the first, that was a 44-year-old driver who crashed head-on and then he was brought in in the hospital uh, with the, the life support so what were their scenarios? So now we could have known that the scenarios will remain the same. We should always start with A, B, C, D, E first. So since in this case, the patient's airway is already been taken care of, patient is having an uh, ET tube inside, ET tube, endotracheal tube, and is on a bagging thing. So airway may be maintained. So we should be now focusing on breathing part. If the breathing is okay, he's not developed any tension, pneumothorax or hemothorax. If we go for a circulatory assessment, look for any presence of hypertension or any sites from which he's breathing. So we get an uh, immediate ultrasound, live trauma support evaluation done. So patient should be looked for any bleeding inside the abdomen or the pelvis. And then uh, we go for a second, uh, secondary survey, a neurological evaluation. And once ABCD is all taken care of, you go for a secondary survey and then definitive treatment will follow. <clears throat> so to summarize uh, uh, this particular initial uh, management of the trauma patients goes in three phases. The primary survey followed by detailed secondary survey and then the definitive care. And in each of these phases, the evaluation should always be accompanied by a resuscitation. And once this particular phase finishes, we have to evaluate the patient again so that we can go for the second phase. And before you go for the third phase, again, a revaluation has to be done. So revaluation has to be done times and often so that we do not miss a patient from who is deteriorating anytime. So that concludes the, the tutorial, the monologue from my side. I, I see 97 people are still hanging on with me. So now if anybody has any questions, they can unmute their mic or you can just type your questions so that other people do not get disturbed as the microphone is on. So any questions, you can just type on the chat box. So I'm still waiting. I think uh, you people are, can hear me. So now I'm going to unmute the mic. So if in case you want to shoot the question immediately, you can do it. Okay, so Vedanta is asking about fast scan in some detail. Well, uh, that will be a separate class. It's a huge topic. Uh, but then since you have asked, uh, fast usually was an initial concept. Uh, nowadays, we have improvised on the FAST and we are not talking of FAST these days. We're talking of ultrasound life trauma support system or UTLS. Now, how the FAST is different from UTLS is that initially the FAST was only focused on finding bleeding under the diaphragm. Uh, 
So that is to say whether the patient has a, a bleeding because of a liver laceration or a splenic rupture, or the patient may have a pelvic fracture and bleed. So in those scenarios, uh, the ultrasound was used to do for abdomen only. But now with the uh, um, uh, improvisation on UTLS protocol, we are not, look, not only looking at the abdomen, but also in the thorax. So we are looking for hemothoraxes just above the diaphragm. We are also looking for tension hemothorax or a tension hemothorax, which can develop using an ultrasound. Well, tension is a clinical finding, but then you can again using an ultrasound can actually find it out whether this is a blood or the air which is collecting in the, inside the lungs. And at the same time, you can use ultrasound to evaluate the proper resuscitation. So say for example, patient is having a shock. You just give fluid and can check on the intern IVC caliber. If the IVC caliber is expanded, you know that the patient has been well resuscitated you know, before the end organ damage is there. So henceforth, fast scan is now a older concept. Nowadays, we're talking of ultrasound from a life support system where you do not only use ultrasound for diagnosis, but at the same time, use the ultrasound to direct your resuscitation protocol. Uh, Asmita is asking about repeat abnormal flexion and abnormal extension in GCS. Well, the problem of uh, scoring a patient of M2 and M3 the difficult part is that sometimes the M4 may look, look like M2 and M3. So how to differentiate between M2, 3 and 4? So that's a major problem. So how do you identify that is by looking at the leg responses. So if M2 and M3, since they are generated from below the midbrain, patient will always have tonic leg responses. Tonic means tonkako. So uli duiti khuta talatira tonkaunsan. So you can actually see the patient stretching his legs stiffly as you give pain over the cranial distributed area. Now, if the patient is flexing his elbow, is, uh, he is doing an internal rotation of the shoulder, you may say that the patient is having an abnormal flexion. However, um, if the patient is, is, is um, uh, not extending, but rather ex extending his elbow, but then he's doing an uh, internal rotation of the shoulder, then you can say the patient is having an abnormal extension. So in abnormal flexion, it is the flexion at the elbow and external rotation of the shoulder. In abnormal extension, it is the um, uh, extension of the elbow and internal rotation of the shoulder along with bilateral lower, lower leg tonic responses. So M2 and M3, both will have tonic leg responses. However, patient with uh, uh, M4 responses will not have the tonic leg responses, patient just would not be able to localize the pain stimulus. Now, Ujwal is asking about how to do a log rolling. <laughs> I've already showed you, let me show you again. Uh, in one of this slide, it was beautifully sh uh, shown. Okay, so if you see this slide, the patient is being stabilized on a spinal board and the head is, is uh, the patient is having a neck collar and the head is spread between the two boulders. So the whole the spine is, is stabilized from the head to the bottom. Uh, now if the patient needs to be examined from the back, you have to make the patient shift to other side as, a, as if it a complete log of food. So how do you do that? So you do that by asking a team of people to help you. So there will be three people who will be assisting um, in simultaneously rotating the patient as a log of wood, and the fourth person will be examining the patient. So the person who's sitting on the head end of the patient will be more immobilizing the neck. However, the two people who are standing towards, facing towards the patient's face will be pulling the patients toward their side, one holding the torso, the second one holding the leg and the pelvis. And the fourth person, this is the examiner, she is actually examining the patient's back from top to bottom and also will examine the patient's chest and the inner angles. So this is how you do a log rolling and examine the patients together. Now, the last question I think is, could you repeat when to give number two, no to IN muscles in GCS? What is that means? Okay, so if the patient is not able to open his eyes because of mechanical problem, mechanical problem in the sense patient is having a periorbital ecchymosis or the swelling. So patient is not able to open his eyes because there's a swelling around the eye. 
So this is not because of neurological problem. So this is mechanical in, in origin. So that's why you give a suffix called EC rather than scoring the patient as E1. So the moment you put an EC, uh, a suffix behind these uh, numbers, these letters, uh, the, the examiner would know that this is a mechanical problem because of which the patient is not able to open his eyes. And so that would not be considered to evaluate the patients. Look, the role of GCS is for continuous monitoring of a patient. If I say a patient is having a GCS of E4, V5, M6 at the outset, but then later on during his course of stay in the hospital, the GCS drops down to say, for example, E2, V4, M5, then this means that the patient has deteriorated. So a baseline GCS is very important for us. So if the patient deteriorates over these scores in the time of his evaluation or treatment during the hospital, then we know the patient is deteriorating. Uh, regarding muscles, I could not understand your question, but then GCS evaluation is not for muscle power. GCS evaluation is look for high mental function responses or cortical responses to verbal stimulus, to pain stimulus. So you have to examine that. So that is how the GCS is being measured. Now, do we send the blood examination for serology too, along with grouping and cross matching? Well, in ATLS protocol, blood examination is not recommended. It is only for those patients who require immediate surgery or require immediate resuscitation for the blood. In that scenario, whenever you're putting an IV cannula, a broad gauge IV cannula, immediately send the blood sample not only for cross matching or typing or for serological examination, but also for electrolytes and for blood sugar levels because these may be something which may be hidden inside the patient. So that has to be seen. Okay. Anything else, guys? <clears throat> As I told you earlier, GCS is not for the motor power. So even if the patient uh, can uh, fractures a say for example, uh, Anil is asking about how to comment on GCS in case of fractured limb. Well, that's a um, uh, good question. But then if you see it carefully, if you see it carefully, uh, fractures may occur in one or the other limb, but the other limbs will be okay. So if the patient can follow your command, then it's okay, the patient is M6. If the patient can uh, sh uh, show off the pain stimulus, then patient is M5. If one of the leg is fractured, but the other leg is showing tonic leg responses as you're giving pain, you can say the patient is either M2 or M3. So even in the fractured limb, some of the movements can still be generated and this can tell you about the patient's GCS. As I have told you in my presentation, the patient is having quadriplegia and is not able to move even all the four limbs. At least you can say patient is either M6 or M5 by asking the patient to show his, uh, to open his eyes, to, uh, blow, to make a puff, uh, in his mouth or to uh, uh, stick his tongue out. So all this movement, if the patient can do as per what you're asking him to do, then this means the patient is M6. If in case patient gives a grimace response or makes faces on giving some pain stimulus, then the patient may be having um, M5 response. However, if the patient is quadriplegic, you definitely may not be able to tell whether the patient is M2 or M3 or M4. Uh, but then uh, at least these things you can say. Yes, anything else? Well, Amit is asking about, oh, okay, uh, Rahul is asking about where is the pain stimulus given to observe the abnormal flexion and extension. So pain stimulus should always be given in an area which is cranial nerve distributed area rather than um, spinal distributed area. So spinal distributed area means anything below the neck should not be given because that will generate a spinal reflex. And you may be confused whether the patient is being giving an M5 response is just a spinal reflex. Uh, so pain is being given over the supraorbital margins uh, to stimulate the supraorbital nerve or over the tragus or the earlobes so as to generate a vagal nerve stimulation. So in these cases, the patient will have uh, 
some amount of trigeminal nervous stimulation. So patient may have some amount of pain in the face and the patient will try to lift his hand up to show off this pain stimulus. The other area can be underneath the mandible to, um, to generate a pain. So you rub the, the, the fingers underneath the mandible. So because of which also patient will have some pain in the cranial nerve distributed area and can lift his hand up to show off that pain. Uh, at the same time, at the same, uh, okay. And then the last question I think Amit is asking is about what is the choice of fluid for cessation? Well, ATLS says the choice of fluid is ringer lactate. So it's in uh, crystalloid. So we like to give crystalloids uh, as soon as possible if in cases we are uh, looking at the patient's uh, hypertension. Now, what amount do we use depends upon how much is the patient's requirement. If the patient is in shock, and the, the shock can still be graded. I will talk to you about these topics later and well in the management protocol for shock. Uh, this, uh, so in that cases, you have to give a challenge. Now the challenge of the fluid has to be given by at least one liter of fluid in the fast phase. So we give a one liter challenge, the patient responds, uh, responds to the shock, then you think this is a patient is, a, is an early responder. If he requires another liter of fluid to come off of a shock, then this is known as a late responder. If the patient does not give any responses to the fluid restriction, even after two liters of fluid, that is ringer lactate, then you call it as a non-responder. So depending upon how much fluid you are giving for the patients to build up his blood pressure, you can classify this patient as early responder, late responder, or a non-responder. So early responder means that the patient does not have lost too much of fluid, uh, not lost too much of blood. Now, you may be knowing that um, 100 ml of blood would require at least 300 ml of crystalloids or ringer lactates to be, to be replenished. So that is a ratio of one is to three. So if the patient is requiring one liter of fluid to uh, overcome his shock, then this means that the patient must have lost at least 300 ml of blood. So that's why the patient is only having um, um, uh, is an early responder. This means the patient has not lost too much of blood. However, the patient is a late responder, then this means the patient has lost a significant amount of blood. <clears throat> so in that cases, say for example, in a non-responder or a late responder, patient would definitely require a blood transfusion at the earliest. So since uh, cross-typing, uh, cross-matching and typing takes time, so for, the, for that moment of period, you can actually buy time by giving crystalloids. So anything else? Okay, so if uh, there is no question, I think uh, today's session had been informative and helpful to you all. If in case you like to ask any questions, then you can just uh, type me these questions either um, uh, I am on the Viber group, and then we will see how we can manage to answer the, your queries. And uh, I've already sent a link of the first part of the presentation. The second part link will also be sent. It's, so this computer takes time to save all the file. And as I told you earlier, please do not try to record every session because at the end of the day, you will be having your old hard disk full of uh, these videos. But then uh, it's my own personal experience. We never come back to these presentations again. So it's better to take your time, sit quietly without any distraction for an hour and give your wholesome uh, concentration to the talks. And... Uh, so the early in the next presentation would be on brain tumors. So we'll like to tell you about the uh, the time and the, who's going to present it uh, as soon as possible as everything is, is sorted out. And definitely this limitation of 100 students is a difficult thing in Zoom. Uh, so we are trying to overcome it. Let's see what uh, the Kathmandu Medical College has to decide on that or the Kathmandu University has to decide on that. So till then, thank you for listening and uh, keep in touch and happy learning. Bye-bye.